This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. I was uh, kind of cruising through some uh, some stuff the other day, and I came across this uh, uh, I came across this article. I don't even remember where it's at. Uh, oh, I found it on I found it on a news uh, ABC 13 News. I don't know where ABC 13 is, but uh, I ran across this article uh, that says. 1.5 million brew beer at home. This is a guy that's according to the American Home Brewing Association. I didn't even know that there was an American Home Brewing Association. We'll have to look into that, that too. Yeah, it's a it's a good organization. Yeah, are you, are you a member? Absolutely. Oh, cool. Yeah, so am I. You are. Why the hell didn't I know about it? <laughs> Uh, but I, you know, I was surprised to see one point. Well, actually, it says one point two million. I, the headline says one point five, but the article says one point two million home brewers out there, guys. Over five thousand breweries in the United States now. Uh, unreal. So uh, I guess the hobby, the hobby is definitely picking up. Um. Back in the saddle again, uh, back from hiatus, uh, we're good for another six weeks. Welcome to the Meat House. Uh, we're listed on TuneIn Radio. You can listen live there. You can also download their app, take us with you if you want. Or if you want to wait for uh, the show for you know a little bit later on, you can go to iTunes, get it there, Stitcher Radio. And, uh, of course, we live at themeathouse.com. You can also pick up the show there. After we're done and over with as well. Call in number is 818 921 4680. If you got something to say, we'll be get, I'm glad to, to yak with you a little bit. Uh, we are on Facebook, The Mead House. Uh, just go up to the little search deal up there and just type in The Mead House. Uh, and uh, you'll find us. Uh, Ryan Richardson, back from his. Uh, Wayward Adventure in California. We'll talk about that here uh, coming up shortly. Uh, Aaron Martin in the house. Mississippi Chris Spencer along for the ride. Jeff Schaus uh, with us. And, of course, my name is J.D. Webb. Um, Jeff, did you were you able to uh, catch up with anybody on Facebook this week? You know, I've got a couple uh, a couple quick shout-outs here. Um, over uh, over on the Mead Makers page, I had uh, – I saw that uh, Jamie Pringle Blair uh, was posting on a stuck batch that uh, it, it stuck around 1040. And thanks to, she said, uh, you know, so, some extra nutrients and uh, a good like restarter. She actually managed to get it to uh, get it restarted. We've talked a time or two um, on restarting a stuck batch and problems with stuck batches and things like that. So I wanted to give her a quick shout out just to say, hey, congratulations on getting that going again. I know that's a trying issue and that's a, a pain we all deal with here um then uh over on the mead group i saw um Warren early had a an, an interesting brew he was making up uh banana split mead uh used a ton of cocoa nibs it looks like and he hasn't actually put the bananas on that yet it looks like he's putting the bananas on in secondary but the color on this was really interesting it was kind of a yellow brown very clear. He hasn't used any fining on it whatsoever. Um, just a, a really nice color, and the idea of using a lot of cocoa and uh, uh, some banana flavors together uh, in a mead sounded pretty interesting to me. So I wanted didn't, to give him a quick uh, shout out too. Didn't didn't Chris have something of an awkward looking color? What did you call that thing, Chris? Oh, the uh, the chocolate orange. Something or other, yeah, that uh, looked oh, like. Oh, uh, yeah, that was awful. <laughs> like goat vomit, I think you said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it looked like, yeah, it looked like a uh, uh, Himalayan yak puke or something. <laughs> there you go. Um, 
Uh, wow, a banana split. That sounds interesting. Uh, I mean, I love a banana split, you know. Uh, you know, it'll be interesting in a mead, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, well, cool. Uh, thanks for the update. Um, what are we drinking tonight? Uh, let's start off with Jeff. Uh, what'd you pour tonight? So, um, yeah, and uh, for my own part, I mentioned this on Facebook just after our last episode. I, uh, I picked up one of those carbonation caps that uh, we were talking about, I think it was last time, and uh, was playing around with that. And the the Saison that I made last uh, late last summer, I think it was, um, I was intended to be a lot more carbonated than it came out to be. I, for whatever reason, the carbonation, uh, the, uh, what do I want to say? The bottle conditioning just didn't take off the way it was supposed to have. And so I carved up a few bottles of those and I'm enjoying one tonight. It's, uh, the, the carbonation does give it that extra little something that I was hoping for. And I'm just really pleased with this one. This is easily one of the best things I've ever brewed. Cool. Excellent. Aaron, what'd you pour? Tonight I'm drinking a porter. This is the Alberta Clipper Porter from Great Lakes Brewing Company in Cleveland, Ohio. Kind of an interesting porter. It's brewed with chocolate and raspberries, two uh, flavor combinations that really go well together. Um, Kind of subtle raspberry flavor that's kind of there in the the background. And the the chocolatey porter flavor, just a, a real nice smooth drinker for sure. Cool. Mississippi, I know you've been uh, you've been busy with the uh, with the scalpel here lately. You drinking coffee tonight, or did you manage to get some into that alcohol uh, cabinet? Oh uh, no, I I did something interesting. You remember my my uh, sticky situation with the decoction and the Bach that I oh uh, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah mm-hmm. um, well I'm finally to a point where I'm trying to decide how it's going to turn into a into a braggot. So I took a little traditional and mixed it with it, and uh, I'm trying that out tonight. So there you that's go. pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think uh, it'd be better brewed together, uh, but the Bach by itself, uh, Jeff, you're going to – I think you're going to be proud of it. All right. Since you're a, since you're a, or was it you or your wife that was the big fan of Bach? She was the Bach fan, yeah. I I enjoy the Bach from time to time. She's the one that's a a strong Bach preference, though. Oh well, she'll be happy. Wasn't he? uh, Wasn't he hoping that that thing was was going to come out like the worst thing ever? Wasn't he like praying that thing was going to come out the worst thing ever, so he didn't have to go through all that again? I don't know that I'm going to go through it again, even if it's good. <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, I'm yeah, thinking I more are. that uh, I'm thinking the melanoid and malt may be the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there are some hybrid decoction mashes that aren't quite as involved that I think uh, that I've gotten good results with, too. So, um, you know, yeah, no, there, there's a, a ton of different ways to skin that cap. <laughs> hey, uh, all right, Ryan, what's in your glass tonight? I'm drinking a hibiscus and ginger mead. It's a commercial one, uh, and it's it is very, very uh, <clears throat> strong on the ginger. It's not bad, but it's uh, definitely definitely for ginger lovers. <laughs> yeah. Does it, uh, you know, I, I've had a couple of ginger flavored stuff and I get this, uh, and it's almost like a medicine y type taste. Do you, do you get any of that or no? You know, they ba- they tried to balance out that, that spiciness or, or I guess whatever you'd call that, that ginger flavor, mm-hmm. um, with, with the tartness of the hibiscus. And it's, um, it's not bad. I'll tell you, if I, uh, yeah. It, it could probably take a little carbonation, and then I think it'd be real nice. Cool. Well, I, uh, I'm i drinking the one that <clears throat> Ryan referred to as very refreshing. Uh, it's just, This is my orange braggot. Um, 
uh, and it's coming along very nicely. Uh, it's in a, well, half of it's in bottles and the other half is in a keg. I've managed to, uh, put one case together, kind of put it away. Uh, gonna save that for the summertime. In the meantime, I'm drinking the stuff that's in the keg. Uh, and I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm, Ryan's gonna give me a little more input on it here in a little bit, but, uh, I really like this. This is probably one of the best things I ever did. Uh, and I am going to do another one and uh, maybe change it up a little bit. Uh, I've got a couple of kits ahead of it before I get there uh, along the same line as the orange thing. But uh, this one is not the orange cream that I intended to, have, you know, when I started out. This is just straight up uh, a beer kit with uh, orange, uh, orange honey in it. And orange peel, no lactose, no tricks, no vanilla, no nothing. And uh, I'm very proud of this one. The next one I do, however, I want that one to come out more like a cream soda, like an orange cream soda. And that one we're going to add some tricks to it, some lactose, some vanilla beans, and uh, and see what we can make of it. But uh, so that's what I'm. Um, and while we're talking about Ryan, we might as well just uh, get right to it, uh, Ryan. Uh, you know, it's a. Uh, it was indeed a pleasure to have you and Andrea out uh, this way uh, in California. Uh, Ryan stopped by on his way to, uh, we'll call it Middle California, up around the Santa Barbara area, uh, and uh, had emailed me before his trip and said, "Hey, I'm coming out. Let's get together for lunch." Uh, and so we met up here at a local burger joint, uh, Islands uh, Burger, that uh, my wife and I frequent quite often. Um, and uh, really enjoyed uh, some, some nice company, some good burgers, and some cold beer. Um, what did you think of that whole experience, Brian? It was uh, – the lunch was great, and the company was even better. <laughs> um, we – yeah, Andrew and I uh, loved – you know, loving able to stop and, and meet with you. And, and, uh, we had a wonderful time. Um, you know, I think we, I think we hung out for almost two hours at the restaurant, uh, just, just kind of chatting. And, uh, and then JD gave me, uh, a, an assignment, you know, he went, uh, went out to his truck and he handed me about, I think he said, this is enough to keep you drunk for 72 hours. <laughs> and, Something uh, like that, yeah. And uh, and handed me a couple of bags full of his stuff, and and I've got tasting notes because a lot of that stuff never made it out of the Golden State. Um, <laughs> a lot of that, a lot of that stuff stayed right there. Um, so so yeah, so then we we drove up and we spent uh, two and a half days in kind of a central coast country, you know, Los Olivos, Buellton, Solvang area, yeah. um, and then a half day in Santa Barbara and, and went to a lot of, a lot of vineyards, a lot of wineries, uh, and a couple of breweries. We, we ended up visiting 10 vineyards over the course of the two and a half days and two breweries, um, stopped at Firestone Walker, who has their barrel house out, out in Buellton. Yeah. Uh, which is where they do all their all their barrel aging and souring, uh, which was great. And then um, when I went to one of the vineyards, one of the vineyards, um, a great little one called Sunstone, just uh, Los Olivos, no, Santa Inez. Um, Santa Inez, yeah. And uh, that's where Michael was, Jackson's uh, Michael Jackson's house is uh, up there in Santa Inez. Oh, okay. Um, so we're there and the, and the guy pouring, pouring wine at the, in the, in the tasting room has, he's got these, uh, sleeves on, but you can see he's coming up to the sleeves that he's got, uh, uh, full sleeve tattoos. And he had this, you know, a younger guy and didn't, didn't look like, uh, a, a winemaker, you know, maybe I'm a little, little, uh, stereotyping here, but he didn't look like a winemaker. He looked like a brewer. And I was chatting him up and, and somehow our podcast came up and, 
um, we're talking and, and he said, you know, that he was a brewer and he had made some mead in the past. And I, I kind of gave him a, a couple of little tips on, on how he could, you know, make a mead a little, a little better. He said he had a little, he kind of had a little off flavor. It sounded like a little stuck fermentation when he'd made it in the past. Well, anyway, uh, you know, the wineries out there, the tasting rooms all close, you know, about four o'clock, you know, some are, some close at three, some close at four, some close at five. Um, and he was getting ready to close and, and he asked where we were going. We said, Oh, you know, we're always open for recommendations, you know, and we try to have some plans when we travel, but we also try to, um, you know, leave ourselves open to, to be flexible. And he said, um, he goes, let me, let me tell you uh, what you should do one of the nights. He goes, if you're a beer guy and now I know you're, you're a, a good beer guy and a good mead guy, here, here's what you do. You go into downtown Solvang and he goes, my homebrew shop, you know, the, the homebrew shop that supports my local club is called Valley Brewers. And it's in Solvang. And, uh, and he goes, that's, that's where our homebrew club operates out of. You know, that's where, that's our home shop. Because you go into the back, there's a door marked private. And he goes, you, you just, you walk through that, that door that says private. And we operate a speakeasy out of the back room. We got all these nice beers on, <laughs> on draft. <laughs> I love it. And that's something. <laughs> So, so awesome. we, you know, we didn't, we, we did that one of the nights, one of the nights we were, we were going to dinner. Anybody, any, any anybody who's seen the movie, uh, sideways, we were going to have dinner at the hitching post. And, uh, before dinner we said, Oh, let's, uh, let's have a drink. So we went into the, we walked in there, walked into the homebrew shop, walked past the door that said private. And they had, Oh, I mean, they must've had 30 different beers on tap. I mean, all, they all looked like they were one-off home brewers <laughs> wow. and, uh, and it was great. It was a real, real nice experience, real great. Awesome. Um, and so, so, you know, uh, you never know how far this podcast can carry, can take you. <laughs> how did, uh, how did Andrea like the Abel Scoobers? She liked it a lot. She, um, she did. Uh, we we thought it was great. Yeah, the Solvang restaurant. We had a great breakfast yeah. there. Um, everything was was really good. You know, one of the things. Um, one of the things that was interesting too is out there. There's there's kind of three schools of thought on um, the uh, vineyards or the winemaking, and the first school of thought is that. Um, some of these master winemakers don't use commercial yeast. They, they use the yeast that is on the grapes naturally. And they said that that really highlights the, um, the, the, the grape, the wine. So some of these guys, they, um, they will, uh, after the grapes have been harvested, they'll even grow something uh, in between the, the vines, like, like rye or something like that. And then before the growing season starts, they'll till the rye back under just to replenish the the nutrients into the nitrogen and back into the soil. And um, and they said that also gives them uh, a really healthy yeast um, environment that they're able to to do that. So I thought it was really interesting that some of these guys um, completely just use natural yeast out there. Uh, then you've got some vineyards that um some vineyards that will use a natural yeast and then they'll finish it off with the commercial yeast and then you know you've got some of the other vineyards or some of the other wineries out there who um say that they only use commercial yeast you know they go we need consistency for our large batches and we are only doing um uh, you know, the commercial yeast. Now I've, I've kind of gone back and forth here using the words vineyard and winery and they are, they're not interchangeable. I'm using them interchangeably here incorrectly. Um, there are vineyards, there are wineries, there are winemakers, um, there are grape growers, you know, in the, in the same way that a brewer, um, you know, might buy his barley, buy his hops, that kind of a thing, and not grow them. 
There are a lot of winemakers out there who um, do not grow their own grapes. Right. So there's there's about 250. If I'm if I heard if I'm not getting the numbers mixed up, there's about 250 grape growers out there. But then there's about 750 wine makers out there. Yeah. So a lot of guys are buying grapes and making wine with them. That place um, that I uh, the little place that I told you about uh, sort this out uh, winery. Right there, yeah. uh, it's right there in Solving, right there on that main, on, on that, right down the street from the Solving restaurant. Uh, he's, he's a, I mean, he, you know, you, you look at his, inform, at his information, or he's, you know, it's a winery, but he's the same way. He buys grape juice from different growers uh, and, uh, and makes his wine that way. So he's one of those wine makers, uh, not necessarily a, a vineyard owning winery type guy. So, um, but, uh, yeah. you know, you can, you can drive, uh, I don't know whether, uh, you, you wandered any, any further north of solving, but I mean, you can drive up the 101 freeway and go through Santa Barbara and solving and all that and not even know that you're even close to a winery, uh, or a vineyard, uh, uh, so there's a lot of little hidden gems up there that I that I know of. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. Oh, I hear a little one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she just wanted to say hi. Hi there. <laughs> um. Sounds like it might be bedtime or nap time, I guess, huh? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, just, just laying down. Okay. Well, in that, uh, in that bag of goodies um, that you uh, that you took back up north uh, with you there from uh, Sherman Oaks here, um, let's start out with the uh, – now, you got two of the bourbon barrels. You got the uh, – what we call bourbon barrel one and bourbon barrel two. Uh, both of them identical kits. One was made with six pounds of honey added to the recipe. Uh, the other one I held back. I think it was a couple of pounds of uh, of uh, DME and uh, substituted uh, I don't know three or four pounds of uh, wildflower uh, for that, and also used a different bourbon. Uh, let's see. Uh, number one, uh, BB one had. Uh, I believe that was the Eagle Rare. That was with the six pounds. And then, uh, or no, uh, that was the uh, Evan Williams. And then BB2, which was the six pounds of honey, that's that 13% deal. Uh, that was made with uh, Eagle Rare bourbon. Uh, so, so tell me about it. So just just uh, help me understand real quick. The, the BB1, you said, had... Uh, how many pounds of honey in it? Uh, BB one had, uh, I believe, uh, let's see. I got to remember where I pulled that out of the box. Cause they both had the same uh, BB one. I believe was the, uh, the six pounds of honey. That would have been the one that was uh, very high in alcohol. Like, yeah. thir- like 13%. Uh, probably a little on the sweeter side than the other one. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll run through all of these here. Um, BB one had a, I mean, the mouth feel in that one went on for days. I mean, that had an extremely creamy, uh, full, I mean, just, just a huge mouth feel, um, to it, uh, there was, um, uh, a lot of chocolate that I got out of it. A lot of chocolate. It was very, very smooth. Um, and it had, um, uh, I, I was, what surprised me was that there was for, for as dark as it was, there was a, a bit of, uh, acidity. And I don't, that was there. I was surprised by, by a little bit of that, uh, acidic, um, 
uh, you know, more that was, that was there. It was not in any way off putting. It just, I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't anticipate that that, that was going to be there. Um, but it, overall I thought BB one was, was very good. Um, and then for BB two, it had, uh, this one was of the two was, was, uh, the consensus favorite. Um, I thought BB two was more balanced. It had a little bit less of a mouthfeel, which was okay because BB1 had such a huge mouthfeel. Um, it was, I got some bittersweet chocolate notes out of it. Um, I got a little uh, chocolate covered cherry in there too that I was, that I picked up. It was extremely drinkable and it was very, very enjoyable. And it was, it was incredibly smooth. It was, that's one that, that, I mean, that, that, you know, craft quality right there, that, that one was amazing. Um, now you'll notice that when I I'm combining some notes here of, of what was tasting within those, neither one of them, uh, was there an overt taste to me or Andrea of, um, of bourbon. Surprisingly, uh, surprisingly, I find the same thing. (laughs) I found the same thing. And I added, uh, the, now now keep in mind that, uh, for those that are are listening live and those are going to be listening later, these are two identical bourbon barrel kits from Northern Brewer. Uh, the only change that I made, uh, I didn't go with the recommended bourbon. They recommend Maker's Mark. Uh, I've had a lot better bourbon than Maker's Mark. Uh, the, uh, uh, like I said, the one kit, uh, I just added six pounds of honey. Uh, that's the only change. And then use the Eagle Rare bourbon. The other one that I did, uh, Bourbon Barrel 2, I pulled out two pounds of dry malt extract, substituted it with two pounds of wildflower honey, and that's the one that I used, the Evan Williams Single Barrel, uh, and it was, uh, looking in my notes here, I know I've got it written down, uh, Oh, gosh. Uh, I think it was something in the neighborhood of maybe eight ounces of bourbon. Um, so I and I now, use, I used more than the recommended bourbon uh, along with the American oak in that bourbon. So now if you were to do this, this one again, now my again, I, I just loved BB2. I thought it was just magnificent. Um, if you were to do BB two again, uh, I would at the point of, uh, maybe at the point of bottling or kegging, um, you know, do the first half as is, you know, just that, you know, you got your eight ounces in the batch, you know, and everything's the way it is. And, and you bottle or keg half of it just because it's so good and you know it's good. But then in that second half, I'd double the bourbon. I'd put an additional eight ounces or, or whatever, you know, in that yeah. or whatever that would be, four ounces in that in that second batch just to see just to see if, what that does. But but um yeah, that those that was very good. That I, I really liked that one. Um good. you know that I got two bottles of the orange of your of your orange beer, orange bragging. Yeah, the orange bragging. The first bottle that, and I don't now. This is the weirdest thing. Um, For any of you guys, let me go back to the the trip for a second here. Uh, First of all, if you've ever been to the, if you haven't been to the Central California coast and uh, wine country. And, um, you, you know, looking for a place to go, I highly recommend it. It it was, it was a lot of fun. It was great. I'm not, I'm not that big into wine. I mean, I enjoy wine. I I know a little bit about wine, 
but by no means do we uh, are we wine enthusiasts or wine experts or anything like that. Um, but it was just a really fun fun trip. Now, when you're out there, what you you know they it looks like they pour you this little drop in a in a big big glass and and you know the pours are anywhere. Some of the wineries will pour you one ounce, some will pour you three ounces, but they pour you, you know, five, six or more of them. You know, we went to one place and the guy was the owner that did a tasting and he wanted to tr- taste all 12 of his wines. Um, <laughs> well, anyway, it, it, if, if you go to a place that's got a heavy hand, you know, meaning they're doing about three ounce pours and they're doing you and they're giving you, you know, five wines to taste, by the time you hit your second vineyard, you've had a full bottle to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, now, now this, the first time that we opened the, the orange one, it was uh, after, after a day of, of wine drinking and, and a dinner where we had, you know, some more wine. Um, but it, uh, so you had no idea what you were drinking out of that bottle by that point, right? <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm just saying I may have had a little palate fatigue is all I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, the, when we did that, the first bottle of orange that we opened was very smooth, very refreshing. Um, just a really nice, just a really, really nice beer. Um day and a half later opened up the second bottle and tasted it. Cause I wanted to taste everything again with a fresh palate and mm-hmm. make sure that, uh, you know, everything was there. And, and Andrea had a tasting note. And as soon as she said it, I couldn't stop tasting it. And she said that tastes like an orange Tootsie pop. Okay. And, Okay. And it did. It's it tasted exactly like an orange Tootsie Pop. That second Perfect. bottle. Now, okay. I did not pick. I didn't pick it up with the first bottle. So I I I can't tell you if there was a difference between the two, but I, I you know, it was uh, that. That's what I get out of it. Orange Tootsie Pop. Um, okay. Then JD gave me this bottle of this uh, uh, blueberry, and he said, "This is interesting stuff." <laughs> no, I, no, I thought, no, I think I said this stuff is going to taste like shit. <laughs> I think that's what I, I might've said something like that. <laughs> or I might've said, oh, okay. I, I don't know what I said, but it's, I knew it was going to be a weird experience. Weird. That's what you said. You said it'd be weird. Yeah. Well, when, when we tasted it, um, it, it tasted like a blueberry pie. It it uh, it literally tasted like a blueberry pie. You've got this um, this pie filling type flavor. You, it literally tastes like blueberry pie filling that has come out of the oven. Um, it, it's it, it's also got on the back end. You know, I'm not, I don't know how much of it is theater of the mind because the first the front of it tastes like blueberry pie filling, but you almost get this this graham cracker pie crust on the back end. It literally tastes like you're drinking a blueberry pie. Um, It's very thick. It's very strong. It uh, it's very, very bold. Um, And it needs something. I think it's, it's, it's like an after dinner dessert drink is how I would, I mean, Chris would probably love it. You know, he loves that sweet stuff. Um, But uh, it, it's, it needs something. It's either an after for me, it's an after dinner dessert drink or it needs something extremely bold to balance it out. Like a, a very, very, very pungent cheese or something like that. Okay. I don't so here's, particularly uh, remember the blueberry, but I would probably bet I had a hand in it. Did I, JD? You, uh, I don't know. Uh, this was made. Uh, here's the recipe. Two gallons of apple juice. This is two gallons of just regular old table juice, like Mott's, okay? Uh, four, uh, let's see, 4.3 pounds, which is what I had in the freezer, of uh, of blueberries. 
Uh, and I started out at 1.120. Uh, it finished at 10.16. Uh, I used 71. And this is one of the 71 Bs that actually went all the way. Okay. Uh, and uh, I used the, the uh, um, and I put one can of apple juice concentrate in after it was all done and finished. Uh, and I let that's you know, the uh, that's the blueberry sizer that we did. Yes, yes. That's what that was your take on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And uh, it was a uh, about a two point three gallon uh, size batch. When it you know all down you know comes to it, but um, and then uh, it got you know it got a regular feeding of nutrients. Uh, uh, for made O, uh, like, uh, four grams, four grams each, uh, three times. The final one was like three grams at 1034. Uh, and, uh, and that's it. So I, I don't know where the pie crust tastes like pie. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. And then, uh, he he gave me a couple bottles of his graph. Yeah, <laughs> and this and, and that's, some weird, this that, a, that's that's some weird stuff, isn't it? Yeah, this yeah. this stuff. Um, uh, this was the last bottle I tried. JD also gave me a, a bottle of traditional and a bottle of his wine. And the those both came back home. So the bottle of traditional and the bottle of uh, wine, I don't have tasting notes on. But the the graph was very interesting. It was uh, it had it had lots of carbonation, um, and it also had tons of apple up front. Just just you know like uh, like biting into a crisp apple. Uh, and then hey, stop, I got, stop 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 right there for a minute. I want to go go over to Chris. Uh, Chris, you know, my stuff is about what, what do we figure two or three weeks older or four weeks older or, uh, yours is like four weeks older than mine. Okay. Yeah. You're about, you're about a month behind me on that one. Yeah. So at, yeah. at this point, I mean, we're probably a couple of months into this now. Uh, I don't have, I don't have the, the page up on my notes here, but, uh, Remembering your tasting about this time period, uh, is that what you got to? Because I, you know, this thing changed like, you know, like like people changed their pants. Okay, uh, it mm -hmm. seemed like every week there was there was something different about it. I remember you talking about that very thing. Now, did you well, get a lot I, of apple? I'm gonna guess. I'm going to guess that, that what Ryan is tasting now is probably about where I tasted mine for the last time. And I didn't really get a ton of apple on mine. Um, there was, there was some apple in the aftertaste more or less, but nothing really up front. Uh, and that's when I decided I'm not tasting it anymore. I'm putting it, putting it down. And I'm going to forget about it for a while. So I haven't tasted it since. Uh, but there was a period, uh, like from the time it was finished until it was maybe two or three months old, uh, there was periods of time when it was nothing but apple. And then you taste it the very next week and there was no apple. And then a week later, it was all apple again. So it, it just came and went the whole time okay so, so this, maybe ryan got lucky and and hit it when the when the apple was forward i don't know well and ryan this was uh this this, this graph was put together on november 30th so uh, go on with your tasting notes from the graph sure so so again lots of carbonation apple up front and then in the middle i I put a, I put crystal malt question mark because I forget if the recipe I forget if you use crystal malt or not, but I thought that's yes. what I was tasting in the middle. Yes. Okay. So I did. I got I got a, a lot of crystal malt in the middle, and then 
on the back end, I got a um, a little uh, bit of soapiness in the in the in the finish, and you know I. I I know you probably weren't, you know, it's not that you didn't, it's not that you didn't not rinse the, uh, the glass that you're putting it in. The way that I describe it is, um, a lot of people, uh, when they eat cilantro, um, it tastes, cilantro tastes like soap to them. It has a soapy taste to them. Um, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Hate it. Yeah. Oh wow! So, some people get yeah. that when they taste carrots and, and that kind of thing, but but cilantro is the big one. Now I worked at a I worked at the headquarters of a of a very very big restaurant chain, and uh, one day our food team you know was doing uh, kind of a tasting panel, and and they have these different um, tasting strips they call them of paper, and you can put them on your tongue. And depending on what you taste and, and that kind of a thing, it, it, different people uh, taste things differently. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, and, and there's different ways that you can test that. So that's the way that I, I, I kind of say it is I got this, this soapiness in the back end in the same way a lot of people get soapiness out of cilantro. Um, now, if somebody... Now that, you know, I don't know how many people that affects, but, you know, you could probably ask somebody else, you know, on the street and they would say, you know, I don't get any soap out of this. You're, I don't know. What, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Um, but that's just the way that I, I perceive it. So that's what I kind of got. I got, I got a lot of apple up front and then I got that crystal malt right in the middle and then that, that soapiness on the finish. Interesting. So overall, uh, overall, um, is that something you would like to drink or no? You know, for me, the now here, let me ask you. So, so Jeff and Chris, you guys said that when you taste cilantro, you, you get that soapiness. Uh, my guess is you guys don't eat a lot of cilantro. No, when I, when I go Mexican, I, I tell them to no pico de gallo because it's, it tastes just like a bar of soap. Mm, wow. Yeah. I'm so I'm on the moderate okay. end of that. I I can tolerate like the rice at Chipotle, even though it is just inundated with cilantro. There are some places that go like there's the 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 uh, salsa they put on the table is so heavy on cilantro. It's just like, did you rinse this after you put it through the wash? Because it tastes like ass. Wow! <laughs> yeah. uh, wow! So interesting! Wow! Yeah, so, cilantro so tastes that... like yeah, soap to me. Yeah. See, I, I don't get <laughs> any of that, and when I make guacamole. Or my homemade pico de gallo. I put a crap. I, I mean, I, I put a bushel of cilantro in mine. I love this stuff. Interesting. How interesting. Okay, go on, Ryan. I was gonna say. So I don't. I don't know what uh, what ingredient or what uh, reaction between ingredients is giving me that soapy that soapy finish. But if um, if I were able to identify that and, and eliminate it, uh, I think it's interesting. I'd be interesting. Um, it's, it's the concept is something that I think is, is worth putting on my list to explore. Um, but I'll want to do it in a way that, uh, I try to try to reduce the chance of that outcome happening because, um, you know, it, it's just, Getting could that soap out of it uh, is not something could, I want to have a gla- I want to have a glass of. Could something like mm-hmm. that be related to the hops you use? I wonder. Possibly. And you, yeah, know, but, you, know, uh, you and I, uh, you and I did the same thing. We used exactly the same recipe, yep. hops, everything. everything. I don't get any soapy flavor whatsoever on mine. I, um, and, and I don't either. And I love cilantro, so. <laughs> well, yeah, but I could see possibly the isomerized um, hops from the boil, uh, the the same thing that causes bitterness, getting a soapy flavor. The the idea that I've been, the explanation that I've been given as far as why everything tastes soapy to me when I go out to eat Mexican, is that this is uh, the the bitterness of soap is kind of an, an indicator, evolutionarily speaking, of something we shouldn't be eating. That 
for whatever reason, at some point or another, one of our ancestors said, oh, this is poisonous. It tastes nasty. I'm going to, I, this tastes awful. I'm going to survive while my idiot friends are eating this and are dying. So I will get to make more and survive and repopulate the species. Um, <laughs> it, it, I, well, I don't think it has a lot of, 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 of uh, use here, but no, there is a, there's a level at which the soapiness is related to bitterness and the bitterness from the hops is, is definitely a possibility or a possible culprit from it. Um, yeah. So using less of a floral hops like Buggle and more of a, a, um, a piney or a, uh, a citrusy hops like an American hop breed could change it, but that would really change the, the nature of the drink too. Well, and the only, uh, the only thing different that Chris and I did from the original posted recipe was add four bags of black tea, just straight up, uh, just straight up, you know, Irish black tea. Uh, and that was just for tannin. Yeah, and I don't think that would have anything to do with it. I, 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 no. I, I, I got to go with Jeff. I got to, I got to point to the hops. But I say that uh, because I don't get that soapy now. I mean, we're talking bar soap, right? I mean, we're talking, I mean, if, you know, when I was a kid, if you did something nasty or did something nasty, you had to chew on a bar of soap for a couple of minutes, and that was nasty. Okay, and I remember that. I absolutely remember that like it was yesterday, five minutes ago. And I just don't I get just that. I just remember flavor. that. I remember my grandparents had ivory soap, and I just thought it looked yes. so good that I licked it. And, <laughs> and and so I definitely remember what soap tastes like. And, uh, if they had palm olive, you wouldn't have made that choice. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, but, you know, I do get that in an in, in extreme with, with cilantro, but I do not get it in my graph. Now that's going to be interesting because I'm going to make sure you all get a bottle or two. And, uh, so I, I want to hear if, if it's in mine as well, because I don't get that at all. What I get the last time I tasted it was, it was just a very strange combination of cider and beer. And it was more cider than beer for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it was good. I mean, it, it was really good. I just felt that it just needed some more age on it. I think when everything blends together and all the mellowing is done, I think it's going to be something spectacular. Um, but I just don't think it's ready yet. So you know, maybe I'll send you uh, three or four bottles, and you can taste one now, and then uh, and then put a couple aside and and wait. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, yeah, go ahead, Ryan. I was gonna say so that that kind of concludes the yeah. the tasting and and that. Now, when you were talking about your juice, uh, that some of these. Um, winemakers will have and they'll you know that you can buy yeah. you know and i was just telling you guys about how the different winemakers some of them just use the natural yeast that's on the grape skins and and some start with that and then finish with the commercial yeast and then some just go commercial um when i was uh when i go to my local homebrew store um you know during the North American and the South American harvest. So twice a year, they'll have pre-order forms where you can buy, um, you know, six gallons of fresh juice, you know, from either California or Italy or Chile or, or wherever. Um, and those come already, um, you know, inoculated with yeast. So they, you know, you don't, you don't have to toss any yeast into them. Now I've, um, I've never had the conversation with them on, is this natural yeast or is this, uh, or did they add a com- the commercial yeast to it? But, you know, cause I've never bought, I've never bought a bucket of the juice. 
but what they say is they go the it's already got the um it's already got the the yeast in it that has been selected for the to bring out the best potential of that grape variety so um you know it'd be interesting i think you know with with your grape grower or your the guy you know it'd be interesting to um to hear and talk about um you know if they if they feel that the natural yeast strains that they get are uh, strong enough and, and of a high enough quality to, um, to ferment that all the way through, uh, and not need, um, not need anything, uh, you know, additional. Yeah. I know that, um, well, like I said, I mean, some of the, the process is there's a big truck, huge truck that comes down and has bins of, of grapes. I mean, they still got the stems on them and everything. And, uh, you know, you, you identify your hundred pounds or however many pounds you order and they put it through the destemmer and the crusher and everything. And then, it, you know, you have to bring your own vessel. Uh, and their recommendation is you, you know, once it's in the vessel, you put Camden tablets in it. You got to leave that set for a few days. Okay. Then add your yeast. Uh, let it ferment, and then you bring it back to the brew shop, and they have a press uh, where they, uh, you know, everything gets dumped into the press, and and you know, end result is you go home with nothing but pure juice, uh, which finishes off your fermentation, and uh, you know, you leave it set for a year. And let it age, and uh, if you want to add oak, whatever you want, you know, it all depends on the kind of grape juice you got too, or the, the kind of grapes you got. But now he also buys grapes from up and down the coast. Uh, these aren't all grapes out of his vineyard that he owns. Uh, some of them are, some of them aren't. They, they, you know, he buys uh, lots of grapes from uh, from different vineyards up and down the coast. So, um. I, you know, I, I'm just I'm still kind of kind of thinking about that. I don't know if I want to go that direction yet or not. If I'm ready for it, but um, well, the bottom line, uh, Ryan sent me the, the the final text he sent me was uh, he says you are good at making hooch. <laughs> I thought that was pretty appropriate. <laughs> that's that's the God's truth right there. I pre- Ryan, thank you uh, tons, man. I, I I really appreciate it, and uh, you know I feel like I'm getting pretty, some pretty good honest feedback. The rest of these guys, uh, they're gonna get their bottles here in a few more weeks, and I get all this stuff together and uh, get boxes and packaging and and uh, get this stuff in the mail. But they're gonna get the the, the same thing that you got, uh, and. Uh, uh, Minus the bottle of red wine, I'm going to try to stick a bottle of uh, of uh, what Ryan was talking about. The two bottles that he took home. One was a red wine that I made, uh, and then the other bottle is the first, very first mead that I ever made. Uh, and uh, it's taken this long to taste like anything. Uh, and, uh, so I'll be eager to hear from Ryan when he cracks that one open and, uh, uh, you know, get his, uh, get his, uh, notes on that one. But, uh, anyway, Ryan, uh, you know, I know you had some fun out here, dude. Uh, my wife and I have been up in Solvang area, Santa Barbara many, many times. Uh, you know, it's a good little weekend getaway for us down here. It's so close. Uh, and, uh, Solvang restaurant, our favorite place to eat. And I'm glad you guys had a good time. Um, Absolutely. You know, I was thinking, uh, you know, we took a couple of weeks off, and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, what the hell are we going to talk about for the next six weeks? <laughs> uh, not that we've had any difficulty coming up with subject matter, for sure. Uh, you know, oftentimes this two-hour show runs into, you know, two hours and 20 minutes. Um, or, uh, uh, you know, uh 90-minute show runs into almost two hours, I should say. So uh, I was thinking, uh, you know, I I was thinking themed recipes, okay? Um, We lost somebody. Like Jeff dropped out. Um, 
Uh, let me see if I can get Jeff back. Um, so we were, I was thinking about, you know, a themed recipe. Uh, I thought, you know, summer's coming and this orange braggot that I made, uh, is going to be perfect for the summertime. Um, uh, you know, like Ryan says, it's a very refreshing, uh, uh, drink, uh, which I think would be perfect for even, uh, say July 4th. Uh, but I was thinking holidays, you know. Now, some of this stuff is going to have to age, so it might be appropriate that we start talking about it now because I'm thinking like next Thanksgiving, next Christmas, I'm thinking something special for Halloween. Uh, you know, I'm thinking 4th of July. That's not too far off. Even a nice braggot we could put together and be ready by then. Uh, possibly a mead even by, by July 4th. Um, so I tasked uh, Jeff and Aaron uh, with this ideas. I really don't want to get into putting a whole recipe together right now, but just let's talk about some ideas. What kind of fruits, uh, you know, uh, ingredients uh, would you put together for, let's let's just say, 4th of July? And I think Aaron, well, no, I don't remember. I, I, I don't remember which email I wrote, I, I read, but one of you guys had something uh, that sounded really good for, for 4th of July. It must have been Aaron because I've been holding on to my ideas for tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I know what you're talking about. I, I had referenced in one of the emails, like a watermelon melamel. You know, I think of the 4th of July sitting outside under the fireworks and um, what do you want to, to munch on in, you know, in that type of uh, situation. And, and watermelon is really the, the first thing that comes to mind, um, which, which kind of got me thinking just about melons in general. It, it seems like that, is maybe an underutilized or, or a type of melomel that we haven't really discussed that often. And, and you, at least from what I've seen, you don't really see that much about melon based water or melomel. So there's a reason. That, is there a reason? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you not to, well, I'd made a, about a year ago last summer. Yeah. Well, almost a year ago. I took a, a gallon of watermelon juice or watermelon water, I guess it's probably called, and uh, fermented that with a pound of honey. So just just watermelon water and honey, and uh, it, it, almost you know nine months old here. It's it's still very very thin, uh, kind of weak tasting. You know, you're not. I'm not getting a lot of watermelon out of it or really any um and so what i've actually thought about doing is adding um uh tinctures uh maybe a little a little mint and a little uh maybe a little squeeze of lemon or lime juice because trying to think of what you could do to dress up a watermelon and a couple of things that came to mind for this were was oh maybe a little mint and maybe a little lime you know might go with that pretty well I could see that. Yeah, I I tried that. Uh, and melons do not translate well into mead. Um, and you know me, it was not a lack of fruit because you know how I do. When I when yeah. I make a melomel, I put plenty of fruit in, so it was not a lack of fruit. Uh, all I can say is freshly mowed grass. Uh, <laughs> oh. It oh, was boy. like drinking a freshly mown lawn. Like, uh, like drinking a hay that's bale. Ex that's exactly <laughs> what it was like. And now, is this uh, any any kind of melon or, or, or a melon in particular? Water. Watermelon. Oh, water. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I, I don't know about others. I know that one. Well, uh, you know, there's been, uh, and, and I don't remember, I, I know that there was some discussion, gosh, a long time ago, and back to the old show that I was on, uh, there was some, and I don't remember the gist of the discussion or even the final result, but I do remember a discussion about watermelon. I, I remember there being some negatives to it, uh, but, I, you know, 
uh, what if you could get around it? I mean, you know, we've talked about concentrates before. What if you what if you took that watermelon juice and boiled it and reduced it, made a reduction, and then put that in your watermelon juice? If you follow me, okay, make. You know, if you can, you know, get enough watermelons to make a gallon of watermelon juice and then get more watermelon uh, and put it in a pot and boil it down, reduce it and add that to your watermelon juice. I wonder if you could get away with something like that. You know, and I've also thought about doing something similar to the way they approach um, ice cider where they take the, the juice they freeze it, and the uh, the the part that thaws first, I, is yeah, part, yeah, yeah. Um, gets uh, gets fermented out, and the rest of it just kind of gets sucked off. Uh, it, it's an idea. I don't know how it would work, but it's an idea. Okay, now now keeping along with the watermelon theme here, I, I like the direction you're going, Aaron. Another popular thing in the summertime that my grandmother used to make all the time that went along with the picnics with the watermelon was pickled watermelon rind. Very sweet, had the sweet sour thing going on, tasted like watermelon. I wonder if that would be a, you know, if you could accomplish something like, you know, some kind of a sweet sour combination watermelon flavored. It's an interesting thought. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know how to get the pickle concept in there, but I will tell you, I, I think there are two types of people in this world, people that have tried pickle water bone rye and people that don't know what they're missing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and I'll add to that, pickled green tomatoes. Pickled green tomatoes, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting deep south now. <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay, so it's watermelon. Right there with uh, pickled watermelon rind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love them. I mean, my, my grandmother, my dad's mom, Oh my God! Homemade pickled watermelon, Ryan. Oh my God! Uh, it was like eating candy. Um, yeah. So, so tell me more about that. This is it's something I, I unfortunately am in the group of people that you know. I don't know what I'm missing with that. I, I don't know that I've had it's that the, before. So. It's the it's the it's the white part. You you peel the skin off. Okay. okay. Uh, and it's the just the very thin white part of the melon mm -hmm. minus the skin you got to take the skin off and then she would she would pickle them and i don't know what her recipe is or her i don't know how she did it but uh she would make up this pickling juice and uh i mean these things would sit for like months uh on end in mason jars in her pantry uh and then she would make up i, I don't know simple syrup or where she got the sweet from but you got this this sweet sour thing going all at the same time and then of course the watermelon rind itself is just that it's the rind of the watermelon with the skin shaved off uh and that's what it is you can buy it in the Sounds store it's good Interesting. Go the, I'll uh, have to keep an eye out for it yeah you, usually in the condiment section uh or you know where you'd find relishes and that kind of thing. Look for uh, pickled watermelon rind, uh, and you should uh, you should see it there. Sure. You, you know, know another. Be... Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. Oh no, no, I, I was semi changing the subject, but we were talking about summer flavors. Yeah. Uh, the the most obvious to me and much easier to to accomplish would be a pina colada. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's a very summery flavor. Oh, absolutely. Coconut, uh, right? Pine pineapple, coconut, yeah. Okay. Didn't uh, didn't somebody here have some experience with coconut? Ryan, was that you? Yeah, that's yep, yep. That is the uh, I've done it. I've done two different uses of coconut uh, that. The braggot that I made that I just uh, bile carbonated um, was a uh, coconut stout. So that 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 was done with um, coconut uh, shavings, you know, the, the the white flesh of the coconut. 
And then um, Better, you I toast tried them another. First? Yep, I toasted those. Yep. Okay. And then the other coconut experience I had was um, I tried making a traditional um, using coconut water. So just uh, you know the coconut water and and uh, yeah. and wildflower honey. And how did the coconut yeah. come through in those? In the um, first one, in the the the, the coconut stout braggot, it uh, it's it comes through like a coconut. You know, it's it's uh, it got the coconut smell or aroma and um, and a little bit of the taste and and it kind of as intended the coconut uh water traditional um came out a lot like coconut water <laughs> and uh. and i forgot when i was making it that i i don't really like coconut water all that much <laughs> i don't either <laughs> yeah yeah, I don't either. Yeah. We've um, all got sucked into that before. When you you get this idea for an ingredient, and then you remember you don't like the ingredient. Yeah, yeah. Um, Whoops. So, so and those uh, are the ones that always turn out to be an exact representation of the ingredient. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Exactly. So, Chris, how would you uh, how would you approach the pineapple? I'm I'm thinking secondary, right? Because there's a ton of sugar in pineapple. I don't know that you can be left I would, with much I of it. I would get the no. I'd go to pineapple in in primary. Primary. Uh, yeah. Yep, and then rack on to secondary, and I'd probably go. Gosh, I don't know. I, I would probably go a pound of toasted coconut per gallon. Yeah. Uh, okay. Because that's pina colada is is coconut. So I I think maybe if you went like four. Four to four and a half pounds of pineapple per gallon in primary, and then maybe go a pound or even more uh, coconut in secondary. Let it sit on it for you know however long, taste it along, and see what see what you get. So, uh, how does the? But I'm, uh, I'm making this up as I go. I don't know. I've never done it. Well, you're gonna have. I let that. I let that toasted coconut sit on the braggot for four months and you i could have let it go a lot more uh without it you know becoming too too coconutty um but now that was only one ounce of coconut per gallon of liquid so you know it wasn't because i was trying to be be safe you know of not not overdoing it Mm -hmm. So how does the uh, how does the uh, how does the chief have your surgery schedule uh, for the next couple of weeks there, Chris? Uh, I can't make any pina colada braggot <laughs> or mead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you don't necessarily have to make it, but I was thinking maybe you could come up with a recipe, an idea for a recipe, uh, like what kind of honey to use. I mean, it doesn't have to be a nailed down kind of thing, but something that we can at least say, hey, you know what, this sounds good. Uh, maybe one of us could throw it into a, a you know, a gallon uh, bucket and uh, and give it a shot. So I'm going to cast If you. I were doing this, if I were doing it, I mean, I can tell you off the top of my head how I would approach it because, and it would be purely experimental, but I would go with probably maybe four pounds of pineapple in primary, uh, pulverize it good, and I'd probably use uh, something like orange blossom honey because you want the, you know, you don't want something that's going to overpower either of those other flavors. So I'd probably go with orange blossom, maybe even clover honey, something bland. Um, I'd probably start out. Um, I'd want this thing to finish around uh, ten twenty. So I'd probably start out at about 11.24 to 11.30, somewhere in there. Uh, ferment it out with 71B to get that fruit salad, tropical fruit uh, that, it, that it produces. Uh, leave it in primary for about 21 days or maybe four weeks. 
uh, yeah. make sure you got plenty of pectic enzyme in there and uh, rack it into secondary onto a pound of toasted coconut per gallon. You're probably going to need a really big carboy or something because that's going to be a lot of coconut. Yeah. And um, I just let it sit and taste it. Maybe start tasting it after a month. See what happens. Okay. All right. That'd uh, be my approach. Yeah. Four pounds. You know, uh, as far as Fourth of July recipes go, the the one fruit that struck me that we haven't talked about yet. Um, that I think is is really just synonymous with summer, strawberries. Strawberry, like, yeah. Strawberry desserts are at every Fourth of July get together. My wife and I, my throw, I throw. I've I've resisted tackling strawberries because there's a lot of water in them, and I I, I worry about getting a good flavor out of it, just because strawberry is also a tricky flavor to get right. Yeah. Um. I have an idea for what I want to call a firecracker mead that features strawberries. And I'm not sure if I want to include a, uh, a pepper with that or make it a really fizzy carbonation drink or where I want that fire cup, firecracker concept to come from. But yeah. I'm, I'm noodling that in my mind. Brian, you back? I'm back. Okay. I'm hearing something buzzing. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I heard a buzzing noise. Yeah, somebody's cell phone or something. Yeah, I'm hearing somebody's. Ah, okay, this stop. I don't know what it is, but anyway, okay. So, uh, okay, so we got a pina colada thing. We got a watermelon. We've got, and we're talking summertime here. Uh, I mean, it, you know, strawberry sounds good. I mean, I'm thinking Fourth of July, something cool, refreshing. <laughs> Something crisp and light. Uh, I'm really digging this pina colada. I'm not. I'm not a, a mixed drink type drinker, but I'm kind of digging this pina colada thing. Uh, Chris has got going on. But uh, um, now, move, move, you know, moving on. I mean, there's other things besides the Fourth of July. We get later on in the year. I'm thinking. I don't know, Halloween popped into my mind for some damn reason. I don't know why. Now, I don't know. I you know I have no idea what kind of mead or braggot or uh, you know even a beer or whatever you'd put together for Halloween. Um, but I mean Halloween just kept popping in my head when I'm thinking themed recipes. So uh, throw some stuff out there, guys. You know when I thought about Halloween recipes, the the idea of trick and treat really hit me. Yeah. So okay. everything is kind of everything I came up with is a little bit on the sweet side. So okay. um, maybe something with blackberries or a very sweet or black currant, but with some pepper behind it. Um, or to, to to really stick to this Halloween mead, a sweeter mead with some ghost pepper behind it. Um, the, yeah, this all okay. sounds a little bit cruel to anybody that's not expecting a peppery mead, but. Um, <laughs> I've yeah, got so. a uh, I've got a black currant uh, pepper mead that I called in the heat of the night. That <laughs> would probably be exactly yeah. what you were thinking about. There you go. Yep. Okay. Uh, and uh, I, I had an idea for Halloween. Um, when I thought Halloween, I thought Harry Potter. And if you've read the book, obviously it's uh, Madame Rosemurda's mead. Okay. So it's basically, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you you'll have to interpret the the description of it, but from all accounts, it appears to be a, a maybe a semi sweet mead with uh, a hint of licorice. So maybe some star anise or something like oh, that. Oh yeah, yeah. There you go. Okay, licorice. Some pepper. Yeah. And what? Licorice and what? Fennel. Fennel. Fennel? Yeah. It's a it's an herb spice. Um, yeah, I know very... what fennel is. I just yeah, and I know I, I yeah, I've I've roasted them before, but I'm trying to think I'm trying to remember the flavor. Um It's got a somewhat licorice note to it. Yeah, it does, doesn't yeah. it? It's not quite as harsh as licorice in my okay. mind, but 
Um, it, it combines well with licorice. Yeah. So maybe how would fennel, you some, some that star anise and maybe uh, maybe even some licorice root? I don't know. So how would you uh, how would you work the fennel in, uh, Jeff? You know, there there's a couple of different ways to do it. I mean, it depends on how you're working everything else in. If you're doing, you know, we're we're talking mainly about herbs and roots and things like that. So if you're working everything in together, I mean, um, what we're talking about essentially is a methylene blend, and a methylene blend can be complicated or it can be simple. The um, there there are different approaches to it, of course, and maybe the easiest and most precise is to basically split your batch between different herbs. Um, let the different herbs kind of soak in secondary uh, with uh, with these meads, and then just kind of um, blend them together to get the the desired effect. Uh, the other, and this is a bit more fiddly approach. The other way to, to precisely blend these together is uh, to just take one at a time in secondary or in you know, primary bulk aging, whatever you want to call it. Um, get to the, the level you want and then back it off, try something else, and kind of just keep adding layers and layers and layers. Like I said, that's really fiddly. The The other way to do it and the, the way that I have approached a lot of... Uh, a lot of my methylene blends just for lack of time um, is to, to to blend the the amounts of the herbs based on trying to make a tea with them. Um, get the, the level of the, the balance of the flavors the way I like them in the tea and then use that proportional amount in secondary to uh, to brew. It's not exactly perfect, but it's pretty close. Yeah. Okay. Fennel. Interesting. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so we've got a number of ideas here kind of getting piled up. Uh, I was I'm, thinking. I'm, I'm going back now. Uh, Aaron's got me thinking about that watermelon reduction. Watermelon? <laughs> the, the, no, doing well, the reduction. Uh, that's a, that's a new one. And Chris, I had one other question for you as well on the watermelon thing. So with your experience using watermelon, did you ferment that out in primary or did you add it in secondary? Yeah, it was in primary. Now, remember, this was this was a long time ago, like when I first started. So my mead making practices were not the best. But uh, when I first started, I was trying everything. Uh, you can ask my wife. I had little jugs <laughs> sitting around everywhere with with different things in them, and that was one of them. And and it was it was less than stellar. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Well, so, part of the reason I ask, you know, watermelon is maybe a little bit more of a delicate flavor compared to some of the other fruits that we talk about, like. You know, raspberries or black currants, things like that. And I, I wonder if maybe adding it to secondary where it doesn't go through the, the fermentation process, you know, it might help preserve some of that just watermelon flavor to some extent. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might be a, another approach to, to preserve some of that. Yeah, it could be. But what really struck me was the grass flavor. It was just, so, yeah. I mean, you know, Toro riding mowers could have used that as a promotional <laughs> item. I mean, sounds like uh, it would smell real good, but I don't know that yeah. I'd want that. You know, drinking that out of my yeah. glass. Yeah, but none of the flavor that was supposed to be there was there at all. And uh, was that due to my, you know, inappropriate mead making skills, or was that just the way it is? I don't know. I will say that I've I've heard Michael Fairbrother say on numerous occasions that that was one mead he would never make. So wow. I'm assuming that maybe he ran into the same thing I did. Yeah, yeah, I, I recall uh, that too. Yeah, so I don't does, know. Yeah, and that doesn't necessarily mean it can't be done either. I mean, you know, uh, Aaron, I'm I'm thinking, you know, just whip up a traditional. 
and then dump it in on, uh, you know, uh, three, four pounds of, of cut up watermelon. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, the typical, uh, you know, put everything in secondary type thing. Uh, I don't know if that would work or not. I mean, the, the, the one thing that bugs me about the whole watermelon thing is that, you know, a watermelon is like 98% water. Uh, so mm-hmm. I'm wondering after a period of time sitting on that much watermelon, if it just doesn't thin out your traditional mead and just, you know, I mean, there goes any kind of mouthfeel you would have hoped to have or, uh, yeah, and that, that's why it know. struck me when you said that about doing a reduction, because in order to pull that off, you're going to have to have some sort of concentrate. Otherwise you're just yeah. going to. You're basically going to cut your original mead in in half. Well, uh, and because because uh, well, and the other thing too, because watermelon is so much water, it might take a crap load of watermelon to get a sufficient reduction uh, that would even make a difference. I mean, you you might be having to boil down, you know, thirty or forty pounds of watermelon in order to get. You know, maybe a quart of a decent, heavily concentrated watermelon flavor. So, and by the a, time you boil it, have, is it like boiling honey? Have you just boiled away all the watermelon flavor and well, the volatiles? Yeah. You know, <laughs> so. Well, uh, I mean, yeah. At this point, you're just you're just looking for the flavor only. So, uh, but like I said, I mean, you know, it being mostly water. Uh, I'm just afraid that it would, you know, I mean, I'm just, you know, talking outside of my head because I've never boiled down a watermelon before. Uh, but I'm just thinking because it's so much water that it would take an awful lot of watermelon to get a sufficient amount. I mean, think of it. If you, I mean, if you were doing five gallons, I'm thinking you'd have to have 100 pounds of watermelon uh, to boil down to get a sufficient amount of watermelon reduction. Uh, if it's even possible. So uh, so here's the task. Okay, somebody, find a watermelon somewhere, cut it up, uh, squeeze and squish and whatever you got to do to get the juice out of it, put it in a pot and boil it and let it reduce half uh, and see what you get. Uh, see what you come up with. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know if watermelons are available. I'll have to look in the store and see if, because a lot, a lot of our produce and fruit and everything comes up out of Mexico, and of course they got a twenty four seven growing season down there anyway. So I'll have to look and see. Maybe I'll do it here at the house, but uh, I'll uh, I'll know this weekend when we do our grocery shopping. But uh, do, do any of you guys ever get uh, any of the yellow meat watermelons? No. You never no. had any of those. No. no. Well, they actually have a little bit more watermelon flavor than the red ones. Are, you, so, are, are, are those what they call the Japanese watermelons? Because they get they get a Japanese watermelon out here that are... I've never had... I don't know. We, we have a... There's a variety that's grown here called a Charleston Gray, and they're round. They're not oblong. They're round like about the size of a basketball, and some of them will have red meat, but most of them will be yellow meat. And the yellow ones are have a much stronger watermelon flavor, so that might be a, uh, the way to go there. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I, I hear the same thing for a lot of the, what are they called, the heritage blend watermelons. Um, I, I guess there's a, a variety here that is uh, in, in native to Missouri that's it's got a deep red fruit, but it does not get nearly as big as a commercial watermelon. I think it tops out about the size of a cantaloupe in the store. Um, you, you hear the flavor itself is a lot more intense in those than, than the ones that are made for uh, for size or for you know, commercial distribution and to sit well on store shelves. Um, so there there may be something there. My worry with this uh, with this enterprise, and I, I think this may be why like Michael Fairbrother is, is taking a pass at this. Once we get enough watermelon, the hundred pounds or so to take it to 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 get a, a good amount of flavor, is this even cost allowable? Uh, you know, this yeah. is 
<laughs> we're going to spend a small fortune to get enough watermelon to make this work. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but now, that's why I, I don't know if if Michael ran into the same problem I did, or if maybe he just doesn't like watermelon. You know that that could be another. Well, you know, I mean, maybe just, he hates watermelon. You know, I mean, just <laughs> onto something. I mean, the amount of watermelon that it could possibly take in order to get a watermelon. Uh, you know, a sufficient amount of watermelon flavor. Uh, I don't know. Um, no, you know, might be, sad. might be, might be worth trying to get a hold of Fairbrother and uh, and ask him. You know, mm-hmm. why the hell aren't you yep. doing a watermelon? Tell me why. I've never heard him explain why. I've only heard him say that he would never do it. So adamantly, yeah, adamantly, yeah. he would, yeah. he would never do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, that said, though, I did see said that, around, uh, Oh, go ahead, Ryan. You're you're on topic. I'm not. I think he said that because he couldn't. Uh, he said he couldn't picture it. He said mm-hmm. he said that he needs to be able to visualize what the finished mead's going to be like. And he said, with the watermelon, he could never visualize it coming out. You know, in a in a good way. Mm-hmm. Well, now, he's also said that he's had people mail him bottles of uh watermelon mead just to say hey you know you couldn't visualize it but i could here it is well i visualized it but apparently i was i was apparently blinded by the light uh because my visualization didn't come to reality yeah Uh, somebody mowed the lawn while i was making mine Um, well, I think we're on to something here, so I want to keep pushing forward and I like this pina colada thing. Uh, and although I, I got some of it written down, Chris, I'm going to task you with a recipe for the pina colada. If you can get it down on paper and send it to me, uh, as an idea, we're going to post it up and we're going to ask people, Hey, if you feel like taking a risk, uh, here's a thought for a, uh, for a, uh, summertime, uh, 4th of July mead, uh, and let's do this pina colada thing and see if we can't uh, get somebody out there to do it. Uh, I might even, I've got a couple of spare empty one gallon jugs here. I, I might throw one together as well. So that's I think your I task. Would, uh, I think I would probably do a three gallon because uh, okay. three gallons of mead along with three pounds of shaved coconut would probably fill up a five gallon carboy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's it's probably going to take the full five gallon carboy to hold it, so that's yeah. probably how I would go. And and don't complain to me when you have to clean all that coconut <laughs> out of the carboy. Yeah, yeah. I was just about to say, oh my god, two <laughs> of, just two gallons worth yeah. of coconut. Ah, oh, <laughs> nasty. Man. And uh, for twenty bucks, I'll give you Chris's phone number. So. <laughs> yeah, don't you dare. <laughs> So, uh, okay, so that, that's Chris's task uh, for next week. Uh, nail it down, get it on paper, uh, work the numbers out, uh, and uh, let's see if we can't come up with something that uh, sounds like it's doable. Hell, I'll even, I may even give it a shot at that point. I've got a three-gallon uh, deal. i got a couple of five-gallons empty sitting here, too. Um and uh, for uh, for everybody else at the table, I'm, I'm gonna have to think uh, a little bit for your task. But I, I want to keep pushing on this on this themed recipe thing. So uh, maybe maybe that uh, maybe maybe over the next week or so, uh, let's think about a recipe. Put a. Uh, I like the Halloween thing, uh, Jeff, with the blackberry, black currant, pepper thing. Uh, yeah. trick or treat thing. I, lo- I love that. You know, and the, uh, uh, even the, the liquor. The idea for the black cherry and or, I'm sorry, the blackberry and pepper came from a um, a local barbecue because I'm from Kansas City and we take our barbecue like a religion. Uh, but there's a local yeah. group that does a barbecue uh, sauce that has like fresh blackberries and black, fresh raspberries in it, but it's hot. Um, oh wow! And it is a beautiful thing when those two go together so oh, yeah. i figure if i get that same mix that that really uh the juicy raspberry or blackberry flavor and 
the just that like nice slow burn of Chipotle. Uh, that could be a really wonderful thing. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. And, and with Easter, with Easter coming up, if anybody Easter. can figure out how to get the flavor of those little Cadbury eggs into a mead, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or anything you know, chocolate, <laughs> you know the little eggs with the yellow center and all. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. If you yeah, that can figure that good. out, let me know, please. Um. Yeah, you know, and in fact, when the wife and I were doing the shopping the other day, I noticed the Easter stuff is already out on the shelf for crying out loud. For crying out loud, you know. Uh, but anyway, so uh, that sounds well, good, too. You know, we we did forget to start the show by uh, by wishing everyone a, a happy Fat Tuesday, or for our French-speaking <laughs> friends, a happy Mardi Gras. Well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, so we've got our plan for the next week or so. Uh, everybody's, uh, been tasked, uh, with, uh, with a, a project. Uh, I want to wrap this thing up, uh, just briefly guys. Uh, Aaron, uh, no, uh, Jeff, I think it was you that sent uh, an email with a link. Uh, and I do recall one of the shows we were talking about, oak and uh you know oaking your meads and a style of oaks and a toast of oak and all of that and we i think we briefly talked about you know what if you could toast your own wood right. and uh you sent me a link uh this is a this is a a, a uh, uh an article by i'm gonna butcher this guy's last name matt del fiaco uh, F-I-A-C-C-O. It's either Fiaccio Italiano uh, or uh, Fiaco. I have no idea. But anyway, Matt Del Fiaco, Toasting Your Own Wood Chips. Now, I'll put the link up on, on our Facebook page. Um, I mean, this guy's dealing with uh, cherry wood, hickory, hard maple, soft maple, red oak, white oak, white ash, yellow birch. <laughs> Um, and, and he you know, gives. He has, he has yeah. a little chart there from uh, from, and I I swear it's from one of the companies that does like smoker woods, but yeah. it deals with the the level of char, the temperature, and what kind of flavors you can expect at that temperature of char. I mean, if right. you're at all interested in this, that's that's worth a quick glance to see. Oh, well, that's kind of how this susses out when you're looking at. Bear in mind, this chart is just for oak, but it's got to. It, it, it's kind of got to have a little bit of a uh, uh, similarity for other woods as well. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, vanilla comes out uh, according to this chart somewhere around four, uh, let's say between uh, four, looks like about four thirty to about 440 degrees. Uh, and then goes down from you start losing that vanilla, the hotter it gets. So, yeah, very interesting. I'm going to put this link up on Facebook. Uh, we may even get into a little bit more discussion about it next week uh, when we come back. Uh, but I like the idea of, of uh, perhaps toasting your own uh, toasting your own wood uh, for for some different flavors. Um, along with that, um, my 91 year old uncle, who is always up to something. All right, he's the guy. He's the one that turned me on to this whole sous vide thing, uh, way of cooking. And I'll tell you, if you haven't tried it yet, you you got to do this. Uh, well, he 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 turned me on to something else. He picked up, and this is one of these uh, little smoker deals. Uh, and uh, it's a poly sign. You go to Amazon, uh, look it up on Amazon. It's home smoker. It's a little handheld-like thing. has a little hose to it. You cook your food, and then you you put it on your plate, and you cover the plate with saran wrap. You stick the hose under the saran wrap, fire up this little smoker, and it's like lighting a pipe. Uh, And uh, it only takes 15 to 20 seconds, and you smoke whatever's on your plate, and uh, he he says it's like smoked barbecue like you never had before. So, <laughs> huh? 
And he, he also said that a lot of the bars in Las Vegas, they're doing these smoked drinks with these handheld smokers. So uh, I, I've never yeah, had yeah. a smoked drink. I don't know if you guys have had. Ryan, have you ever had a smoked drink before? I have had a smoked drink. It was a uh, an old-fashioned that they used one of those little guns on, you know, and hit it with smoke. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I think it's more the novelty of it than anything. I mean, it's not that it was necessarily bad, but it, it didn't, uh, I, I mean, it, it didn't make me see new colors that I had never seen before. <laughs> well, you know what, uh, Jeff just said about being from Kansas City and taking your barbecue seriously? Well, I'm very near Memphis, and we take our barbecue seriously, and I think that's just sacrilegious. <laughs> <laughs> to avoid a war between Chris and I related to barbecue and how it should be presented, I will agree. <laughs> Without getting you know. detail. Yeah. Hey, yeah, we're going to leave the barbecue guys alone uh, on this one. That's going to wrap the show for this week. We're glad to be back. We're glad you came along for the ride, too. Hey, we'll be back next week. Uh, We're going to continue this discussion on themed memes, uh, like holiday, summertime, July 4th, that kind of thing. Got some pretty good things going here, I think. Uh, A couple of recipes coming your way uh, next week as well. And then uh, we might even talk a little bit more about the smoke thing, which is very intriguing. Ryan, thank you very much. I sincerely appreciate your tasting notes on the stuff that I gave you to, to, uh, to drink, uh, good or bad. I love it, uh, and uh, I'm glad that you guys had a good trip out here to California. With that, uh, what do you boys say uh, we come on back to the table next week do this all over again? I think that's a good idea? Yeah, let's do that. All right, guys. We'll see you next week.